Welcome to the award-winning Thoughts from a Page podcast, a member of the Evergreen Podcast Network, hosted by me, Cindy Burnett, a voracious reader and book columnist who provides you with casual author conversations and book recommendation episodes, as well as insider information on all of the newest releases that I personally endorse and on the publishing industry in my behind-the-scenes series. With so many books coming out weekly, it can be hard to decide what to read, so I find the best ones and share them with you. For more book recommendations or to find my backlist of interviews, visit my website at thoughtsfromapage.com. Have you read a book recently that really resonated with you and makes you want to read more books like it? If so, submit a read-alike request to me through the Google form included in today's show notes and tell me why you loved it, and I will suggest some similar reads on a future Tuesday episode. If you are interested in reading some great books before they publish, I hope you will consider joining my Patreon group to access digital early reads and pre-pub author chats, as well as my new Traveling Galley program. The link to join is in my show notes. Today, Jane L. Rosen returns to chat with me about her new novel, On Fire Island. Jane is an author and Huffington Post contributor. She lives in New York City and Fire Island with her husband and three daughters. She often takes inspiration from the city she lives in and the people she shares it with. In addition to her writing, she has spent time in film, television, and event production, and is the co-founder of It's All Gravy LLC, a web and app-based gifting company. I hope you enjoy our conversation. And now for a quick break. For the last year, I have been focusing more on my health and eating habits. In connection with that, I have started drinking AG1 in the morning. When I started drinking AG1 daily, I could feel a real difference in my health and energy levels. That is because AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that supports your body's universal needs like gut optimization, stress management, and immune support. Since 2010, AG1 has led the future of foundational nutrition, continuously refining their formula to create a smarter, better way to elevate your baseline health. I recommend AG1 to all of my family and friends because the company has a team of doctors and scientists. It is tested for 950 contaminants and is NSF certified for sport. It is formulated based on the latest science, and it maintains high quality standards. Thanks, AG1, for sponsoring my show. AG1 is a supplement I trust to provide the support my body needs daily. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash thoughts from a page. That's drinkag, the number one, dot com slash thoughts from a page. Check it out. And now back to my show. Welcome, Jane. I am so glad you're here. How are you? I'm good. I'm so glad to be back. Thank you. I absolutely loved On Fire Island. It is a Buzz Reads May pick for me. It will be in my summer reading guide. I will be talking about it to everybody that I know. It is just such a beautiful book. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So before we dive into that, I just want to tell you something really quick. My oldest daughter, who is 22, is the biggest fan of yours. She loves, loves, loves a shoe story. And I will be passing on Fire Island to her when she gets home. But every single time she says to me, okay, I need a new book recommendation. I need another book like a shoe story. That's what she says every single time. Like it's her gold standard. Wow. That makes me so happy. When someone says something like that to me, especially a younger person, I feel just so satisfied. It's, it's an amazing feeling knowing someone loved your book. And she's told all of her friends to read it and everything. She just absolutely loves it. So I had to remember to tell you that before we started talking about On Fire Island. Please tell her I say thank you. I will. So before we get started with my questions, would you give me a quick synopsis of On Fire Island for those that won't have read it yet? Sure. Um, I actually, I'll just read it right from the hardcover book that I got yesterday in the mail, which is such an exciting thing when your books arrive. Oh, that is so exciting. I hope my copy will be arriving soon. It's very exciting. As a book editor, Julia Morris lived and breathed stories. Whether taking her pen to a manuscript or curled up with a book at her beloved Fire Island cottage, her imagination alight with a good tale, she could anticipate practically any ending. The ending she never imagined was her own. To be fair, no one expects to die at 37. So when the unthinkable happens to Julia, rather than following the light at the end of the proverbial tunnel, she chooses to spend one last summer near those she loves most. As she follows her adoring novelist husband, Ben, to their unexpectedly full home on Fire Island, 
she discovers the ripple effect her life has had on the trajectory of so many. Her baseball-loving, young-at-heart neighbor who believes it's best not to go it alone, two bright-eyed teenagers eager to become adults, and her best friend who must shake off heartbreak for a new chance at love. Uh, Even hearing this summary, I'm like, I love this book so much. Thank you. (laughs) Absolutely. Well, let's first talk about Fire Island. I felt like, in a way, this was a love story to the island, and I now want to visit. So let's talk about your connection there. So... And when you live in New York and you work in New York City, it's like a very common thing to get a summer share somewhere. Uh, some people go to the Hamptons and some people go to the Jersey Shore. And I went to Fire Island, you know, in my early 20s. And a share house is really just, if anyone doesn't, isn't familiar, a house with like possibly 20, 20 somethings in it, all squeezed in, sharing. So a couple of years after I started doing that, I instead went on a trip to Ibiza because, of course, you know, everyone has limited funds in their 20s. And I returned to my roommate. I'm giving you the long version. <laughs> I returned to my roommate saying that she couldn't get to her share house in Fire Island because her back was out. And she couldn't carry her bags. So I accompanied her, carried both our bags, and a really cute guy answered the door and became my husband like a year and a half later. <laughs> And we never, you know, because we met there, like so many people who meet in Fire Island end up settling there because you kind of, it's very romantic. You fall in love. You're on this island. There are no cars. It's, you know, the, the, you know, you read the book, the beach is on one side, the bay is on the other. And it's just an amazingly tranquil, peaceful, youthful environment. And it's fun. And we never left. I mean, I live in New York City, but we go there every summer and we've raised our three children going there. And it's just been wonderful. Well, it sounds wonderful. And as I said, I'm going to have to now set foot on Fire Island at some point in my life because it just sounded like a magical, wonderful place. Well, you'll have to come visit. Everybody come visit. (laughs) You could probably figure out where I live right from the book. (laughs) Well, how about Julia and telling her story? I was so curious about that as I was reading. This is not a spoiler. You've already mentioned it in the summary. She has passed away at 37, but she is able to see everything that is happening with her loved ones. And I just loved that perspective. It was an interesting perspective. I first wrote this story as a screenplay. I was a screenwriter before I was a novelist. And it was really my very favorite story. And the screenplay was just about the three men. It was not narrated by Julia. Really? Yes. So after deciding to write it as a novel and becoming a novelist with a big female following, we decided to put in the narrator and to, you know, and edit to be Ben's deceased wife, Julia. So with that in mind, I took a class, a six week course and with this rabbi in London about the Jewish perspective of the afterlife. And I learned a ton And I took my own, my sister passed away when she was 39. So I took my memories of that and of her speaking to her before she died and everything that went on around that time. And I married those two things and came up with this interesting narrator. I've lost both my parents in the last year and a half. And I feel like that I can tell when someone has experienced that type of grief because the way you portrayed grief was so vivid and real. Versus sometimes I read about grief and I'm like, I don't really feel like this, this person has been through any of this, but I felt like you really had. And I was worried going in that it was going to be really sad and I was going to have a hard time getting through it, but I didn't at all. I mean, I did cry a couple of times, but I laughed a ton as well. And I just felt like it was ultimately such a heartwarming, beautiful story about life and grief and what happens when someone realizes what kind of impact they had on so many people. Mm. I'm so sorry about your parents. Yes, I am. Sadly, I'm very familiar with grief. My father died when I was 11. And then I just told you my sister passed away when she was 39. So, and my mom died, you know, at the ripe old age of 93, a few years back. But I think I am so familiar with it that it was, it's, you know, you could just tap into that feeling and the memories of it and put them on the page. And yeah, it does have more of a, you know, valid reflection on grief, I think, than someone who hasn't experienced so much of it. I think that's right. 
But I like that it was funny too. I mean, I always enjoy funny stories. I like being made to laugh and to smile. And I felt like you interwove the two very well. I mean, I do not think this is a sad book. I even when I when I spoke to the person who was doing the narration for the um, audio book, I made sure to tell her, please don't even, you know, go down that road of moroseness. Like it's upbeat because having been through this so many times, you know, life is just because something is a sad time in your life. Funny things still happen and good things still happen. And and you you know realizing the people around you that support you during sad times is also a beautiful thing. So yes, yeah, some people are like, oh, this sounds like such a sad book, but I mean, you agree, it's just not. It's definitely not. No, I just think it's more uplifting. I agree with that completely. So that is one of those things that I make sure I express that when I'm talking about the book because I definitely think it is uplifting and it's just thought provoking as well. So you decided to write from Julia's perspective. What was that like? I mean, I understand you took a course and you're kind of rehabbing the book or reformatting the book, but was it hard to have her voice to think about what that would be like to have passed away, but still be kind of overseeing everything or being able to see what's happening in our world? It wasn't difficult at all. I don't know. It's because maybe it's because I have such a strong sense of place when writing in this book. You know, I was a screenwriter before I was a novelist. So I definitely see things visually in my head to begin with. But in this situation, I've lived this exact space and it was just very easy to float through it and and float through the story as Julia. It, it, It just wasn't difficult at all. I enjoyed it. That's great. And I do think you're right. There's a very strong sense of place and of the people that live there. And I say this often too, that I think you can tell when people have visited somewhere versus they're writing about someplace they've just looked up on the internet. And clearly you have spent much time on Fire Island. Yeah, that's an understatement. But I agree with you. I learned that lesson when I was writing a shoe story and there's a small, like a chapter in a shoe story where they go and visit Jackson Pollock's house in East Hampton. I don't know if you remember that part. Yes. My husband and I took a ride out there on like a fall, cold fall day during COVID. And the this woman who runs the place, it was closed because of COVID, but she gave us a personal tour. And when I left, I realized it was such a lesson. Like I, I got so much more out of it than reading books and looking things up on the internet and all the other different ways that I research things. And it was pretty amazing. It was a very good lesson. Because it just made a much deeper connection. And even ideas for the story came right out of this woman's mouth into my head. You know, it was just amazing. Well, I think what happens is you can look it up on the internet and get some great information that way. But you don't really have a sense for where it is in relation to everything else. Unless you have boots on the ground and you're looking straight at Jackson Pollock's house or you're touring the inside of it. But you're looking around, you're seeing where everything is, how it's structured what it looks like. I just think it's really, it's not able to be replicated. Absolutely not. And it's, obviously you can't go, I can't go everywhere where my books are set. But even in On Fire Island, I, when I chose these different islands to visit in the midst, you know, in the middle of the book, because the protagonist is a writer, I had just gotten back from Sicily and I added this whole chapter in On Fire Island that takes place in Sicily, which was really fun because I saw it all firsthand. And uh, it was even more fun when White Lotus came out and I realized that the hotel in the on Fire Island is the same hotel from White Lotus. Oh, really? Oh, that is so much fun. Yeah. That was a really crazy season too. Right. So I was a trendsetter, I felt like. You are a trendsetter. <laughs> Not really, but that was pretty funny. Well, and you mentioned the writer aspect of it. That was another thing that I really liked about the story, that Julia was a book editor and her husband was an author. Was it really fun to wrap that whole world into the story? Yes, yes, it was very fun. And also fun because I, you know, I, I have a book editor. So the authenticity of everything was just, you know, she'd challenge anything that wasn't authentic. So I didn't have that worry. Was I doing it justice, you know, or making mistakes, which is always a worry when you're taking on things that you don't really know. Like right now I'm writing a book and the, and the main protagonist is a sculptor. And it's been very hard to learn about it and just hard. There's not a lot of books. I actually went and saw 
a great movie at Angelica last week about a sculptor. And it really was, it was just helpful just to be in that head for two hours and watch what was going on. So yeah, it was very nice that the editor role was edited by an editor. Yeah. She's like, I don't do that. Or you got this exactly right. Yes, exactly. She said things like, it's okay that they are married as long as someone else takes care of like the financial book deal stuff and things like that, you know, that I never would have thought of tiny things. But if someone is an editor in is in publishing and they read the book, you don't want them to say, that's not true. That doesn't ring true. Oh, absolutely. And that's interesting on the sculpting, because I think as I have found any time in my life that I'm interested in something new or I'm researching something new, there's a whole world surrounding every little thing. And you're like, wow, I had no idea. There's this entire world around being a sculptor and sculpting things and learning how to do that. And I just always find it interesting that you just sort of step into a whole other world around whatever the hobby or interest is. It's so fun, actually. I just love it. And I get just very aware of my surroundings, especially living in New York City. It's just things will come up and I'll be like, oh, it's a sculpting exhibit. Like it's, you know, it's just there and you're kind of in that space for that short time that you're writing this character. It's a great part about being an author, learning and, you know, experiencing. Absolutely. And New York City is a great place to be for that because there's always something going on and you can easily track most things down. Exactly. Well, what was the highlight of writing the book? It's a great question. (laughs) I don't think the highlight has come yet. I think that the highlight is going to be when I'm in Fire Island and hopefully people are happy with it and not saying, why did you tell the whole world about our islands? (laughs) But I think that's going to be the highlight, sharing it. Has anybody from the island read it yet? No, except for my family. Did you incorporate people from there? Not specifically. Meaning there's not the character of Ben does not match up with a single person or more the character of Shep, who's the older man in the book. He is like an amalgamation of every old man that's there. The market, if you want to look at that as a character, is very similar. That would be the closest. It goes on and on. There are people like that are similar, but there's no one person. You know, the fairy captain, similar, not the same. So yeah, there's no one that No one's going to say to me, you put me in that book. Well, that's what I was just going to say. A lot of times I know authors say people come up to them all the time saying, you put me in the book and you'll be like, no, no, that wasn't you. I just pulled all sorts of details. So I wonder if you're going to get any of that. I think I will. And I heard the doctor's wife on Fire Island told me that a lot of people have been saying things to her like, I hope I'm not in Jane's book or do you think I'm in Jane's book? (laughs) So it's kind of funny. That is funny. But I think that is one of those things that happens when you write about a real place. Yes, definitely. So did you find any characters particularly difficult to write or were there any that were really easy to write? It sounds like Julia was easy to write. Was there anybody else? Everyone was pretty easy to write. I did like have a few sex scenes in this book that was, I think, like the deepest I've ever gone on that front. And those were hard to write, but hopefully I tackled them okay. I don't know. What did you think? Oh, absolutely. It didn't stick out to me. So that's a good sign because usually if I'm like, oh, this was like way too in depth or I didn't like some of the phrasing they used. So I felt it was all handled very tastefully and and was handled well. And I don't want to spoil some of that because I know I was just made made me think about those scenes, but I don't want to spoil who they're with. But I thought it was really well done. I thought that Renee's husband, there's a character in there, a best friend character, Renee. I'm just telling for whoever's listening. And her ex-husband was difficult to write because I had to toe the line between like not liking him at all, hating him. And why did she marry him in the first place? Like there had to be some redeeming qualities in there because here it is, this lovely woman was married to this man. So that was difficult. And I find that always to be difficult when there is any male or female character that let's say cheats or leaves or whatever, does something very negative, it's hard to balance and give them redeeming qualities. Yes, because everybody in the book can't be totally likable because that's not the way the world works. But you don't want to make people so unlikable that readers are upset. Like, why do I have to read about this person? They're terrible. Exactly. And like, and why did she marry him to begin with? Like, right. Doesn't make any sense. Yes. And I think definitely those type of things, marrying people originally and then living with them over time, There's just so much change that can happen. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
So Ellen Hildebrand has a quote on the cover of your book that had to be super exciting. I never met Ellen Hildebrand, and she is one of my biggest supporters. I mean, how amazing is that? Because a lot of times you see a quote on a book, and really it's because they're friends. You know, that's why they got the quote. That's what's kind of messed up, I think, about these blurbs on books. For example, I mean, I'm guilty of it too. I'm friendly with Katie Kirk. She's blurbed all my other books. Did she like the books? Yeah, she loved them, but it's not, you know, I'm her friend. She's not going to say, I don't like them. So <laughs> the Ellen Hildebrand relationship is just so pure. She, she literally read Eliza Starts a Rumor, loved it, and became a fan. And that's it. It's, it's wonderful. She's wonderful and generous and a beautiful person. Well, and it's something about you being one of her favorite authors. I don't have the book in front of me, so I don't have the exact quote, but it's something like that, right? I'll read it. I do have the book in front of me because I slept in bed with it last night because <laughs> it came in yesterday. <laughs> okay. I love that, by the way. It says, want to get away? Spend a delicious, idyllic summer on Fire Island with a cast of characters who will win your heart and soul. Rosen's intimate, detailed descriptions of the charms of Fire Island provide an irresistible escape. Ellen Hildebrand. I love that entire blurb. But the one I was talking about was the one that is on the galley cover, which says, count me as Jane L. Rosen's biggest fan. And I just thought, how cool is that? And you're right on the, the blurbs. And I always really carefully read blurbs now because I know exactly what you're talking about in terms of the relationships between authors. And I get it, but I want to see exactly what it is they're saying, because I think that can make a big difference. You can read between the lines. I agree. I agree. But, you know, it's you get as an author, I get asked to blurb often. And at the beginning, I always said, yes, yes, yes. And I still say yes, because I want to support other authors so badly, just as much as they have supported me. But sometimes I say, if I have time that way, if for some reason I really don't like the book, I could say, I'm sorry, I didn't get to it. Absolutely. And that is a great way to handle it. And of course, I totally understand the blurbing and the industry and helping each other out. And I'm all for that. But I have just sometimes been a little burned when I'm like, oh, so and so blurbed this book. And then I read it and I'm like, hmm. And then I go back, look at the blurb and I thought, oh, I probably should have picked up on that. So I just think there is an art to reading them and seeing what's been said. <laughs> well, you're an expert. I don't know if everyone has that skill, but yeah. Well, just because I read so many of them, but I get that. But I did love that she's your biggest fan. And I love what she says about Fire Island as well. She's amazing. So you know me, and I am always talking about covers. And I was really thinking about your cover before we started talking because of what we talked about earlier, the sadness, the happiness, the story. And so you want to make sure your cover signals, this is a summer read, this is a fun read. There's so much heart and just everything about it. So you don't want it to look grim on the cover. So did you have in mind what you wanted to do? How did Berkeley handle that? Did it come back like you thought it should initially? What was that process like? Well, could I ask you, do you like the cover? I do like the cover and I think it fits the book, but I just was kind of thinking more about it because I think sometimes there are books that are trickier to get the cover right. So this, this is the first book that I've written that I did not really participate in choosing the cover. And I say this because I did it purposefully. Because I have done it in the past, and then I've always felt like, I wonder if I made a mistake. I wonder if they were on the right track and I was on the wrong track. So for this book, I just left it in their hands. Yes, I approved it. I changed the On Fire Island from an orange to a red, the, the type, the color of the type. But aside from that, I really let them go with it, roll with it, and they rolled with it. And I think it's a beautiful cover. I do too. But I have been so unhappy, I think I said in a minute ago, like when I have read a book that has this kind of light cover and then it's a much heavier story. Like people talk about that with the Paper Palace a lot. So I was just happy that they gave you a cover that matches the book. I think it does. I think it's kind of like introspective too. When you look at the woman lying, I know when you can't see it, everybody, but there's a woman like reading a book lying in the sand. It's, I think it's perfect. Because you're thinking, who exactly is that? Mm-hmm. Well, before we wrap up, Jane, what have you read recently that you really liked? I just started Meet Me at the Lake by Carly Fortune. I loved Community Board, Tara Conklin. I'm going to read The Celebrants, Stephen Raleigh next, because every single thing, I mean, he could write 
a laundry list and I would love it. I agree. And um, yeah, that's, uh, you know, I have a big pile. Like we talked about before, I have a huge TBR. I know you're working on your current book and often authors don't read a lot while they're doing that because they want to focus on the book, not get distracted by other stuff. So you probably haven't had a lot of reading time. I haven't, but I'm looking forward to starting up again when I turn in this book next week. So I'm going to bring a big pile to Fire Island and really delve in. Well, and that'll be so much fun to be doing social media from Fire Island this summer. It will be fun. Well, Jane, thanks as always for joining me. I really appreciate your coming on the Thoughts from a Page podcast, and I can't wait for everybody to read on Fire Island. Thank you so much, Cindy, and say hello to your daughter for me. I certainly will, and I know she says hi back. Thank you. Are you tired of seeing your teen or young adult struggle on a path that clearly isn't the right fit? Is your teenager confused about which direction to take after high school? The future of work is changing rapidly, and our kids need to know all of the options available after high school so they're empowered to make the choice that is best for them. In each episode, we explore the latest trends that are shaping the opportunities of today and tomorrow. I'm your host, Betsy Jewell, and this is the High School Hamster Wheel Podcast. Thank you so much for listening to my podcast. If you liked this episode, and I hope you did, please follow me on Instagram at Thoughts From A Page. Consider joining my Patreon group to access bonus content and support the podcast. Tell all of your friends about the show and rate it or subscribe to it wherever you listen to your podcasts. I would really appreciate it. The book discussed in this episode can be purchased at my bookshop storefront and the link is in the show notes. I hope you'll tune in next time. I'm Allison Holland, host of the Kennedy Dynasty podcast. Equipped with a microphone and a long-term fascination of the Kennedy family, I am joined by an incredible cast of experts, friends, and guests to take you on a fun, relaxed, yet informative journey through history and pop culture. From book references to fashion to philanthropy to our modern expectations of the presidency itself, you'll see that there is so much more to Kennedy than just JFK or conspiracy theories. Join me for the Kennedy Dynasty podcast.